he sent paintings, as he put it, to the devil. He had he, the day he realized that it would never gratify his generous appetites. His first attempts had stayed less than mediocre. His peasant eye would see life clumsily and squalidly. His canvases were muddy, boldly constructed, twisted, and defied all criticism. Moreover, he seemed to have none of the artist's conceit. There was no giving himself up to immeasurable despair when he had to throw away his brushes. brushes. All he really missed was his college-made studio, that vast studio in which he had sprawled so voluptuously for four or five years. He still missed the woman who came to pose and whose whims were within his budget. This world of brutal delights left him with exquisite need of the flesh. He felt comfortable, nevertheless, in his clerk's calling. He lived very nicely in a brutish sort of way. He liked this hand-to-mouth work, which did not tire him, yet would send his mind to sleep. Only two things irritated him. He wanted for woman, and restaurant food at 18 sous did not appease the glutinous demands of his stomach. Camille listened, gazing at him with simpleton's amazement. This feeble boy, whose slack, weakened body had not once been jolted by desire, longed childishly for the studio life his friend was telling him about. He dreamed of these women who displayed their bare skin. He asked Laurent questions. So, he said, did you have, as it were, women who took their shifts off in front of you? Of course, Laurent replied smiling and eyeing Therese, who had grown very pale. That must have had quite an effect on you, Camille went on with a child's giggle. I, for one, would have been embarrassed. The first time, you must have stood there, looking rather foolish. Laurent had spread one of his big hands and looked at its palm carefully. His fingers were trembling slightly. Red gleams rose in his cheeks. The first time, he continued, as if talking to himself, I think I found it natural. It's certainly entertaining, this deuced art, except that it does not bring in a sou. For a model, I had a red-haired girl who was adorable, firm, glowing flesh, superb breasts, hips, this wide. Laurent raised his head and saw Therese in front of him, mute and motionless. The young woman was gazing at him with burning fixity. Her eyes, of a matte black, seemed like two bottomless holes, and through her half-open lips you could discern rosy-colored glimmers in her mouth. She was as though crushed, rolled up in herself. She was listening. Laurent's glaze, glance passed from Therese to Camille. The former painter restrained a smile. He ended his sentence with a gesture, a broad sensual gesture, that the young woman's gaze followed. They were at desert and Madame Rakin had just gone downstairs to serve a client. When the table was cleared, Laurent, dreaming of the last few minutes, abruptly addressed Camille. You know, he said, I must paint your portrait. This idea enchanted Madame Rakin and her son, Therese, remained silent. It's the summer now, Laurent continued, and as we leave the office at four o'clock, I could come here and you could pose for me for two hours in the evening. It's the matter of a week. That's it, replied Camille, pink with joy. You shall eat with us. I will have my hair curled and put on my black frock coat. Eight o'clock chimed. Grivet and Michaud made their entry. Oliver and Susan followed close behind. Camille introduced his friends to the company. Grivet pursed his lips. He detested Laurent, whose salary had risen too fast, in his opinion. Besides, it was simply the business of introducing a new guest. The Rakin visitors could not receive a stranger without a certain coolness. Laurent played a decent fella. He understood the situation. He wished to please, to be accepted at once. He told stories, 
cheer the evening with his loud laugh and even warned the friendship of Grivet himself. That evening, Therese did not attempt to go downstairs to the shop. She stayed until 11 o'clock in her chair, playing and chatting, avoiding meeting Lauren's eyes, who, anyway, took no notice of her. The sanguine nature of this fella, the big voice, his heavy laughter, the strong and pungent odors which his body gave off troubled the young woman and threw her into a state of nerves. From that day on, Laurent came around almost every evening to the Rakins. He lived on the Rue Saint-Victor, opposite the port of Vain, in a tiny furnished room for which he paid 15 francs a month. The room up in the attic pierced a loft with a narrow skylight that half opened in its cramped way onto the sky it was scarcely six meters square. Lauren would come back to his to this sad little garret as late as he could before running into Camille and not having the money to go and loiter on cafe stools. He stayed late in the little restaurant where he had his evening meal, smoking pipes over a coffee laced with liquor that cost him three sous. Then he would slowly make his way back to the Rue Saint-Victor, strolling the length of the quays, sitting on the benches when the weather was mild. The shop in the Passage du Pont Neuf became for him a delightful retreat, warm, calm, full of friendly words and attentions. He saved the three sous from his laced coffees and greedily drank Madame Rakin's excellent tea. He stayed there until 10 o'clock, drowsy, digesting, feeling at home. He would only have, he would only leave after helping Camille shut up the shop. One evening, he brought along his easel and his paint box. He had to start on Camille's portrait the following day. A canvas was bought, a minute preparations were made. At last, the artist began the work in the married couple's bedroom itself. The light, he said, was brighter in there. It took him three evenings to draw the head. He carefully traced the charcoal over the canvas in little meager stabs. His stiff, cold drawing recalled in a grotesque fashion those of the primitive masters. He copied Camel's face as a student copies. A classic model with a hesitant hand and awkward precision that gave the face a scowling look. On the fourth day, he squeezed tiny heaps of color onto his palette and he began to paint with the tip of his brushes. He dotted the canvas with thin, dirty blobs and applied some short and crowded hatchings as if he had used a pencil. At the end of each session, Madame Rakin and Camille would be in raptures. Laurent kept saying that they had to wait with the likeness would come that the likeness would come ever since the portrait was begun Therese would not quit the ba bedroom converted into a studio she left her aunt on her own behind the counter at the least pretext she would go upstairs and forget everything as she watched Laurent paint always solemn dejected paler and more silent she would sit and follow the work of the brushes this spectacle did not appear to entertain her much. However, she would come to this spot as though down, drawn by a force, and remain there as if pinned down. Lauren would turn around now and again, smile at her, ask her if she was pleased with the portrait. She would see, scarcely answer, give a shudder, then return to her meditative rapture. Returning to the Rue Saint Victor at night, Lauren would reason at great length. He would argue with himself whether he should or should not become Therese's lover. Here is a little lady, he kept saying, who will be my mistress whenever I want. She's always there, breathing down my neck, looking me over, measuring me, weighing me. She trembles and has this perfectly strange face, all damp and passionate. She needs a lover for certain. You can see it in her eyes. I have to admit that Camille is a sad fella. 
Laurent laughed to himself, remembering his friend's skinny, deathly pallor. Then he went on. She gets bored in that shop. I only go there because I have nowhere else to go. Otherwise, you wouldn't often catch me in the passage de Pont Neuf. It's damp and dreary. A woman is bound to dwindle away in there. She likes me, I'm sure of it. So why not to me, or rather than anyone else? He would break off, waves of self-conceit rising in him, and gaze with an engrossed air at the scene gliding past. Well, too bad, he cried. I shall kiss her at the first opportunity. I wager she will fall straight into my arms. He set to pacing again and was gripped by indecisiveness. After all, the thing is, she's ugly, he would reflect. She has a long nose and a large mouth. Besides, I don't love her at all. I shall bring some nasty business on my head, perhaps. This requires thinking about. Laurent, who was very cautious, turned his thoughts over in his mind for a good week. He calculated all the possible difficulties of liaison with Therese. He only decided to try his luck when he had properly proved to himself that there would be real interest in doing so. It is true that in his view Therese was ugly and he did not love her, but all in all she would cost him nothing. The woman he bought cheap were neither more beautiful nor more loved, admittedly. As it was, Thrift counseled him to take his friend's wife. Moreover, he had not depriving his flesh and had no desire to let slip an opportunity offer to offer it a little nourishment. Finally, such a liaison upon pro